especially Jay's family, who I believe uh, are here tonight. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, the annual Jay Blumler Lecture is organised by the School of Media and Communication. My name is Katie Parry, and I'm the Director of Research in that school. So for those who don't know the person that these uh, lectures are in honour of, uh, Jay Blumler was the Professor of Public Communication at the University of Leeds. And in fact, he was Leeds' first Professor of Public Communication, where he'd established the Centre for Television Research in 1966. So this is a very special Jay Blumler lecture this year. Jay would have been 100 in January this year, so this is also a centenary celebration. I'm here to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor of Political Communication in our own school, Stephen Coleman. So this is an exceptional lecture for this reason too. This year, we're absolutely thrilled that Stephen has agreed to give this lecture, not least because he's a very dear colleague to us, a mentor to me and others, and also was an intellectual comrade for Jay in his later life. So we are here to listen to Stephen, so I promise not to take too much time. If I listed all of Stephen's achievements, I would be here for as long as the lecture. So I just want to make three points. First, I've already mentioned how Jay and Stephen inspired each other, and their writing together on democratic citizenship, civic values, and communication is admired for its nuanced understanding of how changes in the system of political communication can potentially work to undermine democratic norms, but also importantly not forgetting how in such debates, how citizens are not simply passive dupes to external forces, but agents in their own right. Not long after I arrived at Leeds in 2011, Stephen asked me, along with Giles Moss, to co-edit a festrift for Jay, which eventually became titled, Can the Media Serve Democracy? This was an amazing opportunity for me, not only to work with Stephen and Giles on the collection, but Giles and I also had the pleasure of interviewing Jay as part of that book. So on that day, Jay told us that in our field of political communication, values are always at stake whether in relation to the ideals of public service broadcasting or in pursuing a deeper understanding of how media is situated in broader society. Jay told us how his own thinking had evolved through working with Stephen, particularly in relation to the role of citizen deliberation in improving political decision making. Throughout both Jay's and Stephen's work, there are calls to be explicit about the values that we draw upon in determining what matters and who counts. So this is why Stephen is the perfect person to be delivering this lecture in honour of Jay tonight. That's my first point. Secondly, I want to highlight the originality and brilliance of Stephen's contribution to political communication. Whether contrasting the competing realities of the Big Brother House with the House of Commons, or collaborating with choreographers and dancers to explore how voters' emotional reactions to Brexit cannot simply be put into words, Stephen refuses to be bound by rather staid traditional ideas of what political communication is. As we will hear this evening, it is especially in the commitment to carefully listening to citizens or voters and in finding avenues for hope, where others only see despair and division, this is what I think characterises Stephen's work. Third, and this is my final point, this morning I second marked the student presentations for Stephen's module, Ethnography of Speaking, and I think there are some of those students here tonight. As I've done for the last few years, I joined Stephen to listen to the five-minute presentations on an abstract theme given to the students by Stephen, often just a single word that they had to interpret. This is one of the very few times in teaching when we hear students speaking in a more personal and sometimes very revealing manner about their own life experiences beyond the classroom. 
The module is about finding the confidence to speak in your own voice. So especially for those from educational backgrounds where public speaking has not been valued, the support they are given to learn communication skills, to articulate their ideas and feelings, can result in really quite spellbinding moments. The care, honesty and compassion shared between Stephen and his students is an absolute joy to behold and reminds me why we do this job. So please will you join me in welcoming Stephen Cole. give is the fulfillment of a promise that I made to my, my great friend Jay Blumler shortly before the pandemic started. We've been talking on and off for weeks and months about the need for a refreshed approach to the study of political communication in a period of radically disruptive democracy. The textbooks were saying one thing about how democracy works, empirical reality was playing out in dysfunctional ways that called for a new language of explanation. We were grappling with what seemed to be three fundamental changes. Firstly, the object of our studies up until then, which had comprised nation states presided over by predictable political actors adhering to the rules of an established game seem no longer to be relevant. Globalised political power is now increasingly conducted beyond any realm of sovereign accountability by opaque supranational actors and institutions frequently without any regard to what we had once thought of as inalienable democratic norms. Secondly, the mediation of politics, which had once been the gatekeeping province of regulating national broadcasters and a pluralistic press, had expanded in scope and territory to the point of becoming a co-producer of political reality. From being an observer and interpreter of the political scene, scribbling its reports from the sidelines, the media are increasingly constructing and defining the political through their mediatizing power. And at the same time, the new online communicative sphere was throwing old norms into disarray. But thirdly, and I think this is going to be the point of the lecture tonight, Long established norms of political conduct which had once guaranteed a degree of basic social cohesion were being regularly cast aside by rogue actors for whom politics was regarded as little more than a Machiavellian game. Under conditions of intense polarisation, rival population groups assumed postures of partisan enmity acting as if those who disagreed with them had no entitlement to a place within the polity and therefore should be denied the right to be heard or even represented. And at the same time, reckless electoral opportunists demonstrated a willingness to do or say virtually anything in order to gain administrative power, even so far as refusing to afford losers' consent when they were manifestly beaten in elections. Running through these three rupturing tendencies like a strangling thread was a pronounced loss of confidence in the potential of democracy as a procedural and moral mechanism for acting collectively and effectively with a view to determining our moral future. Indeed, it seemed then, as it does even more now, that talk of a better future had assumed a, a quaint eccentricity 
in the face of what appeared to be a comprehensive surrender to diminished social aspirations. The political space of ideas once occupied by an abiding sense of hope in political progress was being flooded by a surge in popular support for hitherto marginal forms of dogmatic fundamentalism, crude nationalist attachments, and insidiously enchanting demagogy. It was as if we were entering into a default democratic pessimism in which surrender to specious and metaphysical panaceas was filling the vacuum previously occupied by enlightened ambitions for the democratic fashioning of our social destiny. And as Jay and I talked about all of this over many days and weeks on the telephone, through emails, over long lunches, we both like long lunches, I found myself returning to an observation of G.K. Chesterton's. That when people stop believing in something, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. It began to seem clear that the only antidote to this wayward drift depended upon the rehabilitation of lost political hope in citizens as architects of our own future. Well, at some point in the course of our long discussions, Jay turned to me and he said in that sonorous tone of his, which left no room for a hesitant response, even from me, Stephen? You are going to give the annual Blumler lecture on the occasion of my 100th birthday. <laughs> and you're going to talk about democratic hope. And it better be good. <laughs> so here I am, several years later, under conditions that seem rather worse than the ones we were contemplating back then. And I cannot tell you how much I wish Jay was here to listen to what I have to say and then ask some of those penetrating questions that he always came up with, questions that would invariably help us to draw conclusions that could only be articulated through the most generous mode of dialectical exchange. Jay Blumler was a person of capacious intellectual creativity, and I hope that what I have to say this evening will do some justice to the penetrating radicalism that he embodied. He always had great confidence in me, and indeed, I wouldn't be standing here this evening as a professor had he not made that investment. But I am, so here we go. I want to use this lecture to probe a feeling. Not an idea or an ideology, a system or a structure, but a feeling. A visceral sensation of being in the world that you are likely to recognise in the pit of your stomach as I attempt to describe it. At its surface, it is a feeling of relentless unease, helplessness and anxiety in the face of what seems like a bombardment of overlapping crises, chronic market failures, political system dysfunctionalities, the imminence of ecological catastrophe, unstoppable life-threatening contagions, globally destabilizing military confrontations. It is a feeling of intense vulnerability within a world that has ceased to seem predictable or controllable in the ways that enlightened modernists once believed it was. It is a world in which terrible things are happening. This country seems to be falling apart. And it often seems that there's little we can do. The intensities of this feeling are unevenly distributed, unsurprisingly, in accordance with how people are positioned within the social structure. Bear in mind that in the early 1970s, the wealth-based inequality gap in Britain was smaller than it had ever been before, and smaller also than most other countries in the world. By 2024, the UK wealth inequality gap is the second biggest in Europe. 
only Bulgaria being ahead. Those who have benefited least from the progressive momentum of modernity and find themselves on the wrong side of conspicuously widened inequalities are most likely to feel the brunt of this anxiety-inducing sense of insecurity. But it is not simply a matter of feeling economically left out or left behind. Beyond the often simplistic classifications of economic status, there are many people who are far from destitute, but still feel bewildered by the new normative accords, who feel betrayed in their emotionally invested loyalties, who sense that they have become symbols of cultural obsolescence and objects of educated ridicule who feel unrecognised, who feel discriminated against, who feel that the very colour of their skin is enough to entitle them to disrespect. And even the more typically settled and sanguine amongst us are getting twitchy as we watch the daily news and sense what strikes us as an imbalance in the laws of moral gravity. When governments can pass legislation saying that a country which judges have deemed to be too unsafe to send people to and canute-like determine that it's safe. When sick people who can't get to work are told you'll no longer go to a doctor to determine whether you're sick, but to an outsourced, fast buck making company, there is a sense of great ontological insecurity. People don't know what things mean anymore. And in the face of such pervasive unease, you might expect fear to be the prevalent reaction. But fear, which was the binding mood of pre-modern regimes, in which people lived in permanent thrall to highly visible, coercive, inflexible, and punishing sovereign power, doesn't quite capture where we are now. For fear assumes that our feelings have a clearly identifiable object, whereas our age is rather more one of amorphous incertitude better understood as anxiety, a condition in which one is struck viscerally by an ineffable aspect of being in the world that throws agency into disorientation in the face of random effects to which it is difficult to adjust and impossible to escape. Unlike discrete emotions, which are about something in particular, political anxiety tends to be about everything and nothing. People find themselves caught in a permanent cycle of responding to diffuse effects that lack legible causation. I would describe this condition that we're in as a sort of multi-dimensional pummeling in which new elements of radical insecurity and foundational con convulsion, from COVID to the cost of living crisis, hit us in a relentless flow, in which orthodox assumptions about fair play are cast aside, in which markets succumb to unbridled chaos, in which vital social infrastructure, such as support for the elderly and children in care, safe school buildings, GP, dental and psychiatric services collapse before the eyes of scared and incredulous dependents, in which innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence give rise to disruptively unintended consequences, in which eco-dystopian scenarios hang over us, threatening to devastate our very relationship within nature, in which global conflicts assume the crude form of gang warfare with rape, torture and starvation justified as routine expressions of bellicose national aggression. And underlying all of these imminent catastrophes is a sense 
that such overlapping crises are more than just contingent misfortunes, but inevitable systemic outcomes of an escalating conflict between the strategic rationality of the system world and the lived quality of people's everyday life worlds. At the heart of this conflict is a discrepancy of pace between contemporary society's capacity to generate long-term effects and its limited pre-knowledge of what they are. So in such circumstances, the very notion of progress, which was once the compelling allure of modernity, becomes untenable and is displaced by morbid expectations. Faced day after day, month after month, with this ominous sense of living in a rupturing present, there emerges a pervasive apprehension of being engulfed by an intractable turbulence. And when people find themselves in this kind of an impasse, and by impasse I mean a feeling of being stuck in an unwanted position from which one cannot think of any feasible way of moving forward, the most pressing temptation is to disengage from communicating about it, to close up or close down, retreating into the illusory solace of withdrawal. For example, as news media increasingly function as a 24-7 register of disenchantment, a depressive chronicle of stymied agency, we know that a substantial section of the population refuses to watch the news in its various forms because it literally gets on their nerves. In an insightful 2022 article about news avoiders, Ben Toff and Rasmus Nilsson reported that, I quote, our interviewees see news as dominated by stories about crime, terrorism and partisan bickering, which generates not only fear, but also feelings of uncertainty and a lack of control or agency. Similarly, in their 2019 article on how Americans respond to news stories about Trump, Maria Celeste Wagner and Pablo Boskowski found that, I quote, the most common emotions that participants said to experience were anger, anxiety, and feeling overwhelmed, unquote. Such psychic reflexes signal a foreboding realisation that what has long been regarded as a moral baseline has become unsustainable. A dawning acknowledgement that once reasonable expectations of a secure existence are being repeatedly thwarted, that confidence in a hitherto inviolable force of historical progress has been confounded by unfathomable contingency. And all of these feelings of immobilising gloom that I'm describing arise from a paradox, the central paradox, I would argue, that lies at the core of all of this. On the one hand, we who describe ourselves as inhabiting democracies hold out the view that we are able to determine our own futures. Our social fate, we assure ourselves, is in the hands of neither divinities nor autocrats. The foundational principle of democracy is that the interests and values of society must always be collectively, self-consciously, autonomously determined by citizens rather than ordained by elites. But on the other hand, most citizens of democracy have come to believe that there is little they can do to counter the sweeping onslaught of cataclysmic eruptions. They are overwhelmed. Quite simply, in the throes of anxiety, people lose confidence in themselves and in the institutions that represent them. Consider these recent findings from reputable political survey research. In 1944, people were asked, do you think that politicians are merely out for themselves? And one in three 
people said, yeah, we think politicians are merely out for themselves. Every year since 2010, that number has gone up. And it is now two out of three people who think that politicians are only out for themselves. In 2022, polling by Ipsos Mori found that 71% of British people agreed with the statement that, I quote, the economy is rigged to the advantage of the rich and powerful. A 2024 poll, only published a couple of days ago by Focal Data, asked a representative sample of the population to agree or disagree with the statement, having a strong leader who can get things done is more important than having a liberal multi-party democracy. 56% of British respondents agreed with that statement. Or look at that most subjective of polling measures, political efficacy, people's belief in their capacity to make a difference through their actions. For over 10 years, the annual Hansard audit of political engagement has asked people to agree or disagree with the statement, when people like me get involved in politics, they can change the way the country is run. Well, in a democracy, you'll expect what, 90, 100% to agree with that. Around two thirds of respondents, 68% actually, disagree with that statement. Rising as high as 84% if you take the richest two levels of the socioeconomic status groups out. Now behind those troublesome statistics are troubled human beings who are struggling to cope within a world that seems to be withdrawing its most fundamental offers of security. In recent months, I've been listening every day to callers to the BBC's popular daily national phone-in show. It's part of a research project that I'm leading, looking at how people are talking about the election in the 12 months leading up to it. And what I've been most struck by is the consistency with which people testify to a sense of thwarted agency, speaking with great force about their incapacity to affect what afflicts them. Listen to these voices, not just the words that they speak, but the sense of disconsolate um, powerlessness that their tone conveys. Nothing in this country works. Got Listen, a lorry driver. Uh, I drive hundreds, if not over, over a thousand miles a week on nights driving lorries. Everywhere you go, you've only got to see, I mean, the roads, the roads are wrecked, the, the train services, waste of time, the NHS is barely, barely functioning. I've spent two and a half thousand quid on dentistry Oof. in the last 18 months because of no dentists. But I don't see how any party can come in and fix the array of problems that we have. I feel very dispirited about it and about the future and, 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 and feel like things are broken and that we need some kind of great reset. Well, yeah, I think we're all walking towards our doom with our eyes closed, aren't we? Does it matter who we vote for? Is, is the outcome going to be any different? Public services are rubbish, not because of the people working in them, but because of the way they've been funded and managed. We're very lucky that the kids go to gymnastics and do other classes and swimming and stuff, but actually that might need to stop because, you know, that money might need to pay for us to have a roof over our heads. So it's just um, scrimping a bit now to prepare for giving the bank more money for, no for nothing in return. So it's, yeah, it's frustrating. What we're witnessing there is the dynamics of collective demotivation, the gradual wearing down of a population spirit. And amidst this waning of hope, even the most modest expectations of a controllable future start to seem like wild utopianism. So what can be done to alleviate this mood of immobilizing anxiety? Well, I wish to argue that what is most needed right now is a politics of democratic hope. The opposite of which is not some sort of level-headed pragmatism, but abject surrender to the ineluctable. 
Without hope, our intellectual gaze is inevitably blurred by hyper-focus upon the contingencies of the present. We become so mesmerized by short-term structural effects that we lose sight of the bigger picture. The long view which is necessary for perspective is crowded out by sweeping surges of overrated footnotes. We can find our attention to the present at the expense of creating, uh, of creative planning for the future. But bear in mind that the future is no more than what we do with the present. And unless people have plans for the future, the future will most certainly have plans for them. Without a future-oriented dimension, human agency, by which I mean the capacity to set goals, identify pathways towards our achievement, and muster the confidence to expend energy upon realising them, all of that is of little worth. Just as therapeutic support for individually experienced anxiety depends upon a person's openness to a dispositional shift, that allows them to utilise positive pathways to get from a state of feeling overwhelmed to one of being able to pursue self-enhancing goals. Recovery from political anxiety relies upon a similar willingness to invest hope in a future that is more than the endless stretching of an intolerable present. Now, I'm well aware that hope can easily be dismissed as a rather glib, lightweight sentiment, a sort of keep calm and carry on cheeriness through which naive optimists surrender to their fates with credulous smiles upon their faces. And people are right to be sceptical towards the sanguine banality of phrases such as hopefully a Labour government will be a bit better than these awful Tories, or Margaret Thatcher's favourite citing of St. Francis of Assisi, where there is doubt, may we bring faith, and where there is despair, may we bring hope. Such hope amounts to little more than wishful thinking, the secular prayers of hapless gamblers. Indeed, in an act of what can only be referred to as sadistic irony, the UK government has named the Rwandan detention centre close to Kigali Airport, to which some of the most desperate people on earth who have been exiled there, the Hope Hostel. Yes, indeed, let's be careful about hope. But beware even more, I would say, of political perspectives that are so immersed in the dogmatically inscribed realism of the present that they possess no vocabulary for imagining a different future. I'm referring here to a style of purported political realism in which positions are so neurotically overdetermined that every policy is framed by what can't be done. Every political speech is an essay in lugubrious expectation management. Every stratum of the population is urged to hold itself in place lest aspiration or desire get them overexcited. Such so-called political realism offers all the scope for creative manoeuvre of a North Korean military parade. So rather than being encouraged to hope for a better future, voters are primed to buckle in tightly in readiness for an enduring present. But if what I've been describing sounds in any way like a critique of contemporary mainstream politics in most Western democracies, don't imagine for a moment that populist political parties and movements offer a more inspirational alternative. The fertile soil for populism is fear rather than hope. Its ideological magnet draws followers to fantasy, which amounts to a lazy adulteration of hope, comprising wild desire, desire minus the effortful work of agency. If mainstream politics occupies a space of bland hopelessness, populism appeals to the magical thinking of radical change without making any significant alteration to social structure or received culture. 
See, it seems to me that what contemporary mainstream and populist politics have both begun to have in common is a failure to imagine future trajectories in which received structures of action and thought might be creatively reconfigured. Both political outlooks discount democratic agency, reducing political subjectivity to a mere target of managerial technique. This amounts, I think, to rather more than what political scientists refer to as democratic backsliding. For that term implies an incremental slipping away from a firm normative base. That's not what we're seeing in the Western world at the moment. What seems to be at stake right now is a loss of normative bearings emanating from a waning of confidence. So I want to suggest that hope is rather more than a feel-good sentiment. It is a resource that has to be worked for if it is to sustain democracy by animating agency. Now, what do I mean when I speak of democratic hope? As I use the term, hope is the affective precondition of agency. It is, so to speak, the feeling of being able to do something that will make a difference. It is a meta-disposition which opens up within us spaces of imagination, reflection, and preparation, whereby we can preconceive the circumstances and consequences of our actions. While agency depends upon what the psychologist Albert Banjora refers to as self-efficacy, which is confidence in our capacity to enact goal-directed outcomes, it also depends crucially upon hope, which converts possibility into galvanised desire. We don't protest or vote or express opinions simply because we have the constitutional right to do so, but because we can imagine the positive effects of such action. Hope, in this sense, modifies calculative cognitive action in terms of affective motivation. It inspires a particular form of motivation that allows us to lean into the future in all of its multiple possibilities and historical incompleteness. To be hopeful is to assume that individually or collectively we're capable of doing something in a goal-directed fashion that links present to a desirable future. So when I speak about political hope, I'm not only referring to the capacity of people to exercise forms of confident agency without feeling that whatever they do will be doomed to the margins of inefficacy, but I'm also speaking about our capacity to project imaginatively. That is to say, to engage with the future as if we have a meaningful degree of control over it. So we can think of the future as something that is coming towards us, formed and finalised, like an oncoming gale, or as something that we are moving towards, shaping its form by the tread of our footsteps and the vivacity of our thoughts. In this sense, Democratic hope entails a call to the imagination, an acknowledgement of the latent power of intersubjective projectivity. Much of the time, assent to the unease of the present is endured for the sake of what the economic sociologist Jens Beckert has called promissory legitimacy, a sort of moral contract whereby the future consists of an endless replication of the binding present only reimagined as going well. In short, it's a kind of counterfactual fantasy. But the future is never simply out there to be sold as a temporal project. It has to be worked for. It has to be made to happen. And the way that it is made to happen are through complex 
processes of mediation and particularly political mediation. If we think of the conventional democratic media system as performing three essential roles, feeding citizens' needs for surveillance of the social environment, opening up spaces for reflection and discussion about policy options, and providing opportunities to hold power wielders to account, we might say that these have become circumscribed roles which are increasingly bound to a repetition of the present. Think about the current moment as we lead up to what seems like a pivotal election. Think of that first role, feeding citizens' need for surveillance of the social environment. Most of the election news and journalistic commentary to which we are exposed is entirely reactive to political effects. It informs us of the dire choices before us in the manner of an oncologist delivering bad news to a sick patient. Voters are invited to contemplate dilemmas that can't be resolved, systems that are unfit and cannot be reformed, scandals emanating from narratives stretching back to points in time before we were ever made aware of them, endless accounts of our exposure to largely incalculable risks. Is it all at all surprising, then, that this induces anxiety? Think of that second role of the political media, opening up political space for reflection and discussion about policy options. To some extent, there are areas of the media fighting hard for attention to create such deliberative spaces. But these are up against online media corporations which are dominated by a business model that depends upon highlighting resentment and rage as a source of consumer attraction. And beyond that, the range of mass-mediated voices, perspectives and options are shrinking as politics becomes increasingly managerial and technocratic. And think of that third role of the media, providing opportunities to hold power wielders to account. But given the opaque and virtual invisibility of many of the most powerful actors and institutions within our global economy, simply identifying them, let alone holding them to account, would call for deep investigative journalism in order to uncover the sources of discrete power and complex institutional interdependencies that constitute contemporary economic, political and semiotic power. And in the absence of such accountability, journalists are left with little option but to endlessly interrogate the figureheads of national sovereignty, carefully avoiding the reality that national sovereignty is usually peripheral to the decisions and indecisions that are the sources of everyday turbulence. So I've arrived at a concluding point where I can start to pull together what I think we can do with political hope. And I want to suggest that from a democratic point of view, we are facing a devitalizing media and a devitalizing set of political choices whilst needing more vivifying choices and opportunities to communicate than ever before. In this context, I want to suggest that hope has a very particular communicative function. And to talk about that, I want to turn to a contemporary of Jay Blumler's, Raymond Williams. Actually, the two scholars were in many ways remarkably alike in this respect. They were both normatively driven scholars, deeply committed to an interpretation of society which placed the voices of experientially laden citizens at its core. Now, in 1961, two years before Jay came to Leeds, Williams gave the William F. 
Harvey Memorial Lecture at Bedford College London, and in it he addressed the question of what kind of communication we have and could have. Exactly the same questions that Jay was to address two or three years later. And in his lecture, Raymond Williams did what he was so good at. He would brilliantly take a word and a concept and take it out of its taken for granted context and make us think about what it really means. And he did this with the term communication, and I'm going to quote him if I may. He said, we are brought up with a certain ideas about communication, which on the whole I think mislead us. We think of it as an activity which takes place after the important things have happened. Communication is, so to say, the news after the event, the passing on of important things after something important has occurred. First there is reality, and then there is communication about reality. This is an astute observation, I think. Too often we think of communication uh, as an after effect something that is used to summarise our experience. But Williams argued that communication is neither just an echo of what has already happened, nor a turgid commentary upon existing entanglements. Much of the time, communication entails creative artistry, through which what we come to recognise as experience is put together in coherent and meaningful Terms. Indeed, communication usually precedes experience, enabling us to invent uh, our future actions with expressive purposes in mind. Now, I'm interested in this conception of communication because it points to the political energies involved in the construction and perception of expansive forms of social reality. It opens up a pathway for reframing our notions of possibility by communicating the political in different ways, by narrating and framing our collective experiences in ways that are normatively salient to us as we imagine and plot our social coexistence. Indeed, some of the biggest and most profitable industries in the world at the moment PR industries, media conglomerates, advertising agencies, exist precisely in order to shape that future communication, to produce reality effects, if you will, that are delimiting to the political imagination because they are not just about decisively joining up dots to a future, but closing down more expansive or pluralistic alternative routes ahead. The view of human agency perpetrated by most of these symbolic industries, though not all and all parts of them, is predominantly framed by what is usually referred to as a neoliberal ag agenda, through which citizens are conceived as consumers, public culture with its energising spaces of connection and solidarity, is incrementally sidelined and local sensibilities are overwhelmed by globalist priorities announced in the name of economic efficiency. As a political theorist Wendy Brown has astutely stated, I quote, when there is only homo economicus and when the domain of the political itself is rendered in economic terms, the foundation vanishes for citizenship concern with public things and the common good. Here, the problem is not just public goods are defunded and public goods are devalued by neoliberal reason, but that citizen itself loses its political valence and venue. And that, in conclusion, is the argument that I want to take for building a democratic hope. For democratic hope, as I am speaking of the term, is the building of those civic spaces, those connections, from public service broadcasting, or what we used to call that, with its explicitly civic mission, 
to increasingly marketized universities, which must return to an explicit civic mission. To schools, which have to return to a mission of enabling young people to speak and to speak loud and to speak differently. To trade unions, to community centres, to civic spaces of every kind. And what I want to suggest, in the words of Raymond Williams again, is that we need to build civic spaces of democratic hope, which are resourced with all of the determination, the riches, the refusal to fail their needs that we are currently squandering on areas of defence. I want to suggest that it is those civic spaces that will save democracy. And that, let me say as a final word, was Jay Blumler's lifetime project. Not only as a scholar and not only as a normatively determined Democrat, but also as someone who described himself as a socialist. To nurture those spaces and habits of civic agency is the most important function of democratic society now. And the question that I would ask every political party that asks for your vote in the next election is whether they will resource those civic spaces so that we end up with something closer to what I have described than Trump's future, Putin's future, cheap and shoddy corporate futures, lousy degrading futures, all of which have been very well planned out as options before us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that absolutely wonderful talk and so much intellectual nourishment there. Um, and so much to take in and I'm glad you did get to hope eventually because I was a little bit worried <laughs> for about half an hour. Um, okay, so do we have any questions from the audience? Who wants to start us off? We're still taking it in. Anyone want to start us off? Okay, Eva. Thanks so much, Stephen. I was hoping you'd get to Raymond Williams. Um, and sorry if this is a kind of classic academic question, but I, went, I wondered if you could talk about um, the structure of feeling and how that concept enables, or how you find it enabling. I know there's so many versions of it in Williams's work, but mm -hmm. I've certainly found it very inspiring. I'd yeah. like to hear your thoughts. Um, it seemed to me that uh, when uh, Raymond Williams spoke about structures of feeling, uh, what he was talking about is how there were prefigured within uh, the connections between people, the mood of people, as it were, the prefigurative vibrations of what was coming down the line, um, something really important. So in metaphysical terms, people might sort of talk about psychic and telepathic visions of what's coming, but these don't belong within a materialist vocabulary. And Williams, I think, was trying to say, what is it uh, within the mood of any historical moment that is suggesting to us 
um, options and possibilities of outcome. Um, I might tell you that when he first used that term, uh, editors were incredibly critical of it and tried to force him to define it. And the more they tried to force him to define it, uh, the more uh, he, he, he made it a complex term. Uh, and, and he was right to do so, and I've been writing a lot in the last year or two about political mood, and I find myself doing the same thing. The more there, are, there is a push to uh, try to put a very uh, clear semantic border around the idea of political mood, the more I want to move towards the porosity of it. Um, and it seems that we are in the midst at the moment, and it's what I was describing in what was. I mean, were it not for the fact that I know that academics love to be depressed, I wouldn't have uh, dared to give the first half hour of my talk. But uh, I know you love it. Uh, but but um, uh, the, 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 um, it is a, a sense. It is a sense that precedes our ability to articulate. Uh, just as Brexit, in a sense, uh, one could think of as a mood before it was ever meaningful as a policy, if it ever was meaningful as a policy. It was a sense in which people uh, were either emotionally invested in something or emotionally offended by something. And they didn't necessarily know what it was, and that's why I make this distinction between fear and anxiety, that it is the lack of the object that often makes a politics so, um, uh, so difficult. And, and it seemed to me that Williams, who after all came from uh, a tradition of drama and literature, which is where people write about those notions of uh, pregnant feelings, uh, that um, is why he was able to contribute that to political theory in a way that, that, that many others found difficult. I'll ask a question if, if no one else has got a question. Oh, David. Glad to help out, Stephen. Um, when you actually mentioned Williams, I came, what came to mind was uh, Bender's idea of the treason of the intellectuals, which nobody could accuse you of, that's for sure. Huh? Um, but I began to wonder as I listened, uh, but not actually disagreeing with practically everything you said, but it struck me as kind of, but that's maybe my own uh, limitation, uh, excessively technical. Uh, um, and I began to actually think, well, surely you're talking here about what Durkheim would call anime, normlessness. And I began to wonder, and I've often been critical of communication studies, of actually being too um, concerned with communications. And, uh, and in doing so, actually miss out the, the wider context, I'm not accusing you here, uh, the wider context of which communications takes place. As you said, Williams talked about the historical moment. Now, if you look at the, um, what I'm suggesting here, um, but I could be far from wrong, um, that what we're actually looking at, if you go back to the, the great classical sociology of Durkheim, Zimmel, Weber, uh, they were actually handling what they saw as a total transformation of society. Uh, and that they had to grip with. Where did the individual fit in that? And I begin to wonder, particularly in listening to you, whether we were not actually in a similar age, an absolute transformation. Uh, difficult to give it a name at the moment, but actually going well beyond anything to do with communications as such. It's really interesting. I mean, I think, first of all, we're always in a period of transition from something to something. Um, otherwise, we would be in a position of stasis. Uh, but, of course, it's the qualitative uh, nature of that transition. And what was interesting about the, 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 the early uh, classical sociologists is that they were trying to work out, in a period of massive industrializing uh, turbulence, what uh, the outcomes of that transition would be. Now, Durkheim, of course, took a, a, a classically functionalist view 
of how social cohesion happens and this concept of anomie arises from uh, a sense of uh, failure in that um, functional uh, cohesion. What I uh, think we are looking at at the moment is a sense in which there is a loss of bearings uh, what, uh, but, 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 but one in which people have forgotten what those bearings were. Uh, um, so, to a very great extent, I think we have a political class that, to a very great extent, is more aware of the game than they are aware of the, the values, the, the intellectual drive uh, that makes the game have any kind of worth at all. Um, so traditionally the assumption was that you accept the rules of the game because you want to do something. Uh, the difficulty at the moment is to know quite what they want to do and for them to be able to explain what, what it is. So I think that you're right in saying that um, uh, there, there is a, a, a danger of, of what you call a kind of technocratic analysis. And there is an argument for saying that much of what I have been talking about this evening has been said much better. Uh, there's not an argument for saying it. There's a certainty in my mind that it is said much better by novelists and poets uh, who have a sense of, you know, the spirit of the age. Ali Smith's uh, um, season novels about, um, uh, around Brexit are, are, are quite magnificent. And they are works of sociology that very few sociologists or political sociologists ha have dared to produce. So there's something really in interesting going on there. Um, and it may well be that one of the challenges, indeed it is one of the challenges, I think, for social science at the moment, to decide what are the, what are the, what, what are the purposes, what are the value drives that are behind the game that we are trying to analyse. Otherwise, why do it? Otherwise, why care about it? Uh, thanks, and thanks, Stephen. It's a really fascinating talk. Um, you suggest at the end changes that sound radical now, that they perhaps wouldn't have sounded radical at a different point in time, but they do sound quite radical. And your final call to action was nonetheless within a system, you know, ask your politicians, what are they going to spend the money on? Are they going to invest in these, in these arenas for democratic hope? And so I wanted to ask whether that is the starting point that you see within the system, or whether you also see other starting points and what they might be. And within that context then, what role does our communication play as citizens, so for example in protest, um, and also as academics of course, in, in this arena and pushing some of these discussions out from this arena into other arenas? Where do you see that fitting? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things about this arena is that this is a public uh, uh, event, and, and one of the reasons that uh, uh, I chose this subject was because it, it's a public lecture. Uh, I, let's say that politics is about the allocation of values, not always rational allocation of values, but it's about that. Uh, at the moment, most of the uh, systematic work of allocation is conducted by politicians and in countries like this by the people who win elections and therefore the pressures that are put on them are enormously important and framing agendas is enormously important and that's where the relationship between public protest and collective action outside of formal political institutional um, areas and those areas become so important because the framing is done outside but it has an effect within and you know that's a, a lot of what Habermas was saying about the uh, his developed ideas about the public sphere that you need both and uh, it seems to me that what I was talking about in terms of civic spaces and civic connections 
is a particular kind of first order politics that is different from some other kind of political demands we might make. We might be making. We might, for example, make demands about whether there should be nuclear weapons or whether there shouldn't be. And there will be people who will say without nuclear weapons we're much less safe and there will be people who say that with them um, we are, are, are much less safe. Similarly, in arguments about the environment, similarly in arguments about economic, areas of economic investment. But the democratic infrastructure is a first order foundational fundament for anything that is going to happen subsequently. Unless we have these spaces, unless we have, for example, if not universities as they are now, places that serve as universities, if not public service broadcasters in the form of the BBC, then some kind of bodies operating as public service media. If we were not to have schools that are operating as places in which children do more than simply get trained to pass exams uh, and get employment, then we have lost opportunities around all of those other things that we might care about. So there's something foundational about the argument about protecting democracy. And I might say uh, that for me, and I think for Jay incidentally, um, what was a very important point in that we are arguing that the democratic institutional infrastructure is a starting point for getting your agency um, connected to resources, to change, to major um, dimensions of power. And I think um, you're right to say that that may seem more radical now than it once seemed. But it was always actually radical because it's never actually happened. I mean, one never actually entirely fulfills the objective of creating fully protected and fully efficacious civic spaces. One works on it. And democracy is not a process of uh, uh, institutional completion. It's not a definitive root map. It is a, a process of building opportunities to do things in a certain way. But the absence of those things, the threat, the existential threat to those things, which I would say, you know, we've seen countries facing. We're seeing elections this year in which countries are facing. We're seeing at least half of the US population in the presidential election and at least probably half of the European population in the forthcoming European parliamentary elections will vote for parties that are direct threats to democracy. Now, that's only got to go higher than half, and that has a qualitative effect which has a spillover effect to everything else we might want to do. So that's why I say it's foundational. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm not sure if this question is going to resonate with you or not, um, but I was minded of it when you, with reference to Williams. Um, what I've really always enjoyed about your work is that obviously you're interested in the formal channels and institutions of, popular, of political communication, but you've always been really interested in popular culture as well, and the seemingly trivial and frivolous and banal. You take those things seriously, and I've always really admired about that in your work. So I just wanted to know, get your reflections on whether you see any de democratic hope in contemporary popular culture. I know you're an avid fan of Love Island <laughs> and Central. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get your reflections on popular culture, especially when those civic spaces that you're talking about, you know, yeah. community centres, schools, universities are under, you know, brutal economic cuts and yeah. political attacks. Yeah. So does popular culture give you yeah. some hope there? Uh, well, uh, I, I think um, I want to give two answers to that very, very important question. One, I don't think 
that um, there is any doubt in my mind that it is through imagination and it is that, that solidarity is at its best and its most exciting and its most vibrant and has its most enduring effects when it is motivated by a sense of fun, by a sense of wanting to be with other people, by a sense of being intrigued by listening to the different and the other, rather than in any sense it being driven by <coughs> anger uh, and rage uh, 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 and a desire for, for, for some kind of revenge. And everything <coughs> that I like about popular culture encapsulates that sense of, of, of a kind of an anti-politics that people ranging from comedians to serious actors will talk about tensions in society without seeking to exacerbate those tensions, but in seeking to invite us to um, rejoice in it and escape from them. Uh, uh, and uh, you, we've talked about Eric Fromm, but somebody who, who's had a profound effect on my thinking over the years, I never persuaded Jay uh, to, to uh, read him incidentally, but is Eric Fromm. Uh, and one of the reasons I find Fromm uh, so liberating as a theorist is that he is interested in what we can become, not the crushed nature of what we are being made to do. Uh, so that's one answer to your question. But the other answer is, and I think it relates to the question that was before yours, is it's about joining these things up. I mean, it's about taking that first order institutional process and linking it to um, what is going on in the, the micro world, in everyday conversations, in the way that people uh, talk about things. I, I don't want to mention just very quickly that Katie said in her introduction, uh, she was talking about the presentations we were hearing from some of my students this morning, and, 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 and they're very moving, and, 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 and politically they're really very important, and I learn an enormous amount from them, and they, they inspire my work. And one of the things that I learn from them is that the political life starts not only at the local, but at the most personal level, and very often at the most intrapersonal level. Uh, it starts in how you dream, it starts in how you laugh, it starts at the, 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 the comments you nearly once made but didn't quite get out. It starts in how you're feeling. And unless we are able to link that sense of the, the psyche of human beings as something that is enriched and, and creative with this very turgid and delimiting political system, then it is, it is the political system that wins. And so I think, you know, that is why I've always tried uh, in thinking about the meaning of politics uh, to start with the individual uh, sitting in front of that television set and not quite knowing what to make of it. Um, I'm sorry if this is a cheeky question, Stephen, but this is an election year, and so is there a party which offers the hope that you describe? Uh, you know, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot that people haven't recognised yet about Keir Starmer. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think that you must vote how you want to. I think that there are parties that have offended my sense of hope. I think there are parties that have offended, and I think it is a question then of deciding who has caused the least offence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so John, uh, 
Uh, I very much enjoyed your talk, Stephen, um, uh, and there's a plenty of ideas there to, to, to uh, wrestle around with. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the idea of power. Yeah. Because it seems to me that central to quite a lot of the problems you've identified, and absolutely central uh, to their correction, are questions of power. Yeah. Power flows, power levels, resources of power, channels of power. And it seems to me, um, uh, with the hopes that you have, and I share those hopes, there's an awful lot of counter power um, being needed um, to get anywhere. Yeah. And I just wonder uh, if you could say a little bit more about what you think the sources of that counter power, institutional but also otherwise, are going to be. Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, so there are two parts of that, and you're quite right, that uh, one of the most important things that we try to understand in uh, the study of politics is the operation of power, both at an institutional level, but also uh, at less tangible and visible levels. Uh, and an enormous amount um, uh, of what I am interested in and what I have been speaking about stems from inequality. Uh, one of the key differences, I think, between the middle of the 20th century and now is are the statistics of, 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 of inequality. Um, that there were a number of countries in the world that were beginning to, in, in, in very radical ways actually, close that inequality gap. They were also opening up um, opportunities. And both of those trends have gone the other way. And power is increasingly now institutionalized, first of all, in very opaque ways, much harder to get at, much more mobile, much more slippery. And secondly, in ways that are less tangible. That is to say, power is much less related in the 21st century uh, to tangible wealth and to making things and to visible resources and much more to uh, forms of immaterial or invisible symbolic resources, semiotic resources, financial resources. Uh, and that makes it much harder to, to recognize, much harder to affect and much harder to get at because of its global movement. But it does seem to me that the second part of your question leads towards an answer. And the second part of your question is, what about counterpower? Counterpower, um, which I think of as hope and agency, is about moving away from that um, immobility, that paralysis, that sense of hopelessness, that sense that there is nothing that you can do about it. So the key is agency because people have got, um, amongst them, uh, an enormous amount of power. They've got the power uh, not only traditionally to withhold their labor, but to withhold uh, their um, willingness to be persuaded, seduced, and uh, uh, bought over uh, to positions that they don't really hold. An enormous amount of contemporary politics is a politics of making people want things that they don't really want, dislike people that they don't really dislike, uh, try to solve problems that aren't really problems to them. And so removing yourself from that uh, sense of um, being um, in hock to power, having to constantly answer to power, being in the shadow of power and unable to do anything about it, is really important. And that, it seems to me, is the counter. Uh, and that's where democracy has its most vital driving force. It is in our ability to withdraw, not in the sense of withdrawing into um, apathy or uh, refusal, but in um, uh, creative and, and, and quite resistant ways, which say, we'd rather do something else. Uh, we'd rather have um, a different view of the world. Uh, we'd rather um, 
think of our neighbours in this way than that way. And um, sometimes those things happen. And of course, we've seen this in recent years. We've seen with, um, for, for all of the limitations of their long-term effects, uh, we've seen it with the Me Too movement. Uh, we've seen it with Black Lives Matter. Uh, we, we've seen it with the Arab Spring. We've seen all sorts of moments in which massive and improbable moments of collective power take shape against all of the weight of the communicative institutions that might prevent those forms of discussion from circulating. Uh, and that, it seems to me, is, 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 is the key counterpart. Stephen, um, when we look at this idea of hope, and for me it's probably an animalistic feeling of hope. So therefore the civic space, the idea of people talking like we're doing today, mm. that's where it really comes from. So how do we combat that against this sort of post-digital era that we're now in with a younger generation? Whereas maybe we can relate, perhaps, or I certainly can at 57, to the town hall, the assembly, the assembly hall, all those sort of things that I was brought up with in the 70s. Yeah, but that I, civic space has now become a social media yeah. kind of space where there isn't that real animalistic approach. And, and, and a younger generation, of course, is born into that. They don't know anything else. How do we engage? Very oddly, that was my, going to be my question right from the beginning, because I, <clears throat> I know how Jay was very concerned about the relationship between journalism and politics. Mm -hmm. And you were saying here about the register of disenchantment in the news media has got on their nerves. Well, of course, they've gone on to social media instead, where the civic space is somewhat, it's the exact opposite with trolling, isn't it? That their public sphere, if you like, is very unsafe. Well, I mean, just on that point, um, some have, but actually large numbers haven't. I mean, what's interesting is that there's a significant section of the population, both in this country and in, and in the United States, we know, um, who, who, who don't seek news from anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. they, might, they might hear it from their friends, but they're not getting it online. They might inadvertently hear bits and pieces online, um, but they are actually actively avoiding it. Um, they're seeking not to encounter it because they don't like what it does to um, um, to, to them. So I, 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 I'm not sure that you're right there or you're right there in this sense. I don't want to create a binary, a kind of moral binary between an offline world where we sit around in town hall meetings, look at each other, and I like your term animalistic, and it is, and there is something wonderful about this kind of thing, and it's why being at a university has always been such a beautiful thing for me. But I think you can do that in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of spaces, and actually uh, some of the encounters that I have had with people online and in groups have been extraordinarily invigorating. Um, and one of the things that Jay and I worked really hard for over a number of years actually got closer to making it part of policy than uh, we th th may well be recognised was our idea for the civic commons, which was taken up by some ministers in, um, uh, in the government in the early 21st century. Uh, and, and actually proposed at one point in a government paper uh, as policy, um, subsequently shot down by Downing Street. But I um, think that there is enormous um, opportunities for hope to circulate. I don't think the context in which that happens um, is determinative, except, of course, in relation to business models which purposely exist in order to squeeze out constructive and sociable discussion. Um, that's deeply problematic, but then of course one might go back to uh, the New England town meetings and say that they were structurally organized in ways that crowded out people who were not of a certain religious or class 
background. So um, structural factors are always uh, recalcitrant and, 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 you know, need to be countered in terms of what John Cormer was speaking about in terms of power. I think that um, there is an enormous opportunity uh, for people to counter where we are now, and that is because of what I was saying in the first part of my talk, that we are at a point in which there are massive, there is a massive sense of vulnerability. There is a massive sense of loss of standards, of uh, moral bearings, and uh, particularly of democratic direction. And I don't have evidence to suggest that that's just a generational thing. I think that there are all kinds of people who are feeling that. And therefore, I am interested in what people do with that. Now, we know individually that there are two things that people do with an anxiety. Uh, they allow it to immobilize them, or they allow it to become a basis for seeking a different kind of disposition. And I think what applies individually could apply collectively. And therefore it seems to me that the social opportunity here is to look for those breaking points, look for those moments where people do not want to simply succumb to an endless avoidance of news, choosing of lesser evils, acceptance of, um, uh, of bad deals, and begin to ask themselves what is a better way of connecting with one another, of being social. And uh, A, I think we have to think this, um, intellectually in order to keep us um, doing what we do. But B, and more importantly, uh, I think it's reasonable to think it because there is historical evidence that that's what people do when they are put under such pressures because humans are thinking, planning and creative beings who don't forever like being told to do um, what is against their interests and preferences. Well, I wanted to simply um, say, re remind you that this is uh, the Jay Blumler lecture. Um, uh, Jay um, would have been here if he could. And even after he died, Jay and his family um, wanted to continue a relationship with this university and this school and have uh, set up uh, a hardship fund which is helping students in the school to study, um, very often against the odds of what we've been talking about this evening, against all of the pressures that they're under. And at the same time, um, I want to say that the school has continued in a really creative way to remember Jay. And if any of you get an opportunity of going in over the school, and maybe not be a possibility right now, but over the coming weeks, you will see on the first floor a, a, a really beautiful exhibition um, with uh, um, Jay's books and photographs of Jay and um, other memorabilia. I think uh, we as a school need to remember what Jay brought to us, what he brought to the subject. We of course have got to go on in our own way. He would want us to move uh, beyond his ideas and not simply to stick in any rigid sense to them. But I think that one of the things that we can valuably do is just take a moment to remember that this lecture, uh, which is held annually, is in memory of a really remarkable figure. And 
I say again, a figure who had a hugely determining effect upon my life, and I would imagine several people in this hall this evening.